This is a production of Cornell University. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. And uh, it's really um, nice to be back here and to see so many familiar faces. Um, I'm going to tell you today about a research project that I have been working on um, in Beltsville for a little while. And, um, and the titles here, basically we uh, wanted to look at how microbial systems um, respond to the application of glyphosate in a variety of, of farming systems. So our objectives are to compare uh, factors in modern car uh, farming systems or cropping systems that impact soil microbial communities, plant microbe interactions and plant health. Now this modern soil uh, cropping systems, that's like political code word for systems that use a whole range of, of technologies, including um, uh, glyphosate and um, Roundup Ready um, gene technology, GMO technology. Um, so the USDA monitors uh, uh, herbicides that are, that are registered by the EPA. We monitor them regularly. And a lot of times um, we'll initiate experiments based on um, comments that are sent in to the secretary from, from constituents. Um, and there was, um, in, the, in the last, well, 15 years or so, the secretary's been getting a lot of um, mail about glyphosate and some concerns about glyphosate. So just a really quick review, glyphosate is a um, compound that blocks the shikimic acid pathway. And this pathway is, is critically important for uh, amino acid production as well as a bunch of uh, secondary compound production. Um, the Roundup Ready gene is a bypass for that blockage. So if you apply glyphosate and you have the Roundup Ready gene, you can continue down that pathway and you're resistant to glyphosate. So that's how the, the system basically works. And it was the first uh, herbicide GMO uh, sort of system that was uh, packaged in the US. So it's a very popular compound. It's applied to about 90% of, 98% uh, of the corn and soybean in the US. And that's in the 90 or so, 95 million acres of each of those, depending on the year. Uh, so you can see that there's a fair amount of it applied to the landscape. And uh, so we're, we're very interested in what the impact of this may be in the large scale. And you can see over time, the, the popularity and the use of it has increased. This is the proportional use of glyphosate among many different types of pesticides. So there's been some issues about the impact of glyphosate for a number of years. And you, you've probably heard about some of them. Herbicide resistance in weeds is, very, is a big one. And this map here below has, has six panels starting in 2002 going to 2012 in which um, it shows the, the states that have uh, the number of glyphosate resistant plant species in the states. And you can see that it's, that it's um, increasing year by year or two, two year by two year. Oh, sorry. There's, um, there's some concern that there's a, there's a yield hit when glyphosate is applied, and this may be a function of multiple mechanisms, and that, that, that's an area of research that's being um, conducted right now. Um, and the main thing that we're going to focus on here is the effects on uh, plant disease ecology, and really, really just looking at some of the organisms that might be responsible for diseases, and not necessarily doing a pathological uh, screening of these, of these crop plants. <clears throat> so there's been a lot of debate about this. Um, impact of glyphosate on plant diseases. And, and, there, and these are just a few titles from papers, um, papers that talk about the effects in the rhizosphere, intera mostly interaction with rhizosphere compounds, as well as interaction with um, metals in the, um, in the soil. Manganese was, a, was an issue. And then there's been some sort of rebuttals to that, talking about the, um, this paper is mostly based on the stoichiometry of glyphosate application and how much actual compound you add to the soil relative to the amount of other things in the soil. And uh, this, this is a pretty well done study. So there's been a lot of debate out there. And we were um, partially because of, of well, um, and, and one of the main figures that was constantly referred to was this figure from uh, Kramer and Means. Kramer's, uh, <clears throat> out in uh, Purdue. And this, this study, was, they have produced many figures that look like this. Uh, you apply glyphosate at, um, 
at time zero and within say 40 days, 50 days, you have uh, significantly more fusarium colonies growing on the roof. And fusarium is a, is a wilt disease that's, that's, um, that's fairly ubiquitous in, in cropping systems. But in this case, the, the claim was that these, um, this type of fusarium was, was pathogenic and was um, building up in the soil in all of these millions and millions of acres of corn and soybean. So we were asked to, to sort of review some of this literature and, and look back at, at, the, at what was done to try to, uh, that, that came to these conclusions and, uh, and ask this question, um, if, see if we could revisit this question. Does the, does the application of glyphosate indirectly shift the composition and function of the soil, um, <clears throat> uh, of, the, of the root and the soil uh, microbes? Um, does the, does the presence of the Roundup Ready gene in a crop cause a shift in the microbial community associated with the roots of the crop plant? And um, does the legacy of glyphosate application, and we, we decide on plus 10 years, uh, greater than 10 years, does that contribute to the uh, differences in, in uh, root associated microorganisms? So we did, we did this study at multiple locations and looking at both bacteria, fungi, and, um, and in a sub-experiment, nematodes. But I'm just gonna focus on the fungi today. And this is a, a picture of fusarium forming conidia. Okay, so where we did this experiment, or the, the site I'm gonna talk about today, is the USDA Beltsville Farming Systems Project. Um, and it's one of only, uh, it's one of just a few long-term farming systems uh, projects in, this, in the country that compare um, some sort of conventional tillage, a no tillage, and organic systems all at the same site and all that were sort of experimentally designed to be compared. Um, this is in the uh, Chesapeake Bay watershed, so many of the issues related to Chesapeake Bay eutrophication are applicable to the practices that we carry out here. And so we abide by the phosphorus standards that have been implemented by Maryland state as well as any EPA or national standards. Uh, these plots were established in 1996 and the field was no-till for 11 years before that. So they did no-till to try to sort of normalize things and then impose these, uh, these plots. Um, the way it's laid out, we did a, I didn't do it, I was here at the time, but they, they did a very, uh, an extensive spatial survey of this whole entire field and based on uh, physical and biochemical attributes, uh, blocked this out. Lori, did you, were you, did you help in doing this? No. Initially no, with no, Dr. Ravenhorst from? I was free from that. Okay. Yeah, Lori has helped with the, with the project over, over, over time, so I, I wasn't sure. Uh, this is done by Dr. Ravenhorst at um, University of Maryland. And this is how, uh, it, how we decided, or they decided to block it out. Uh, and this is what the farm looks like. There's like slight rolling hills. This is a wheat crop here. That's um, a major highway right back there. Um, the plots are 30 feet wide and 390 feet long. Uh, we, we use full-size tractors and, and 10 foot uh, implements, 10 foot wide implements to plant. We're, we actually got a 30 foot planter now. We're gonna plant in one, one run now. Um, and so that's just a kind of a view of what it looks like. So, so I'm, gonna, I'm gonna sort of zoom in to this area to show you the plot layout so you get an idea of how the experiment was designed. So we have, um, we're in this, uh, what I'm talking about today, I'm gonna be comparing four different systems. A uh, no-till system and a chisel-till system. They both are three-year rotations, corn, soybean, wheat, mineral fertilizer, and herbicides. And there's two organic systems, either a three-year or a six-year rotation. The three-year is corn, soybean, wheat, and then a hairy veg. And the six years, corn, soybean, wheat, and then it goes into three years of alfalfa. And they both have uh, legume and animal manure, and we use uh, cultural practices to suppress weeds. So if we zoom in on, this is just rep three, what you'll see is the different systems that we have compared here. Every system is composed of subplots. And the reason we have subplots there is because we have every phase of the rotation present every year. So corn, soybean, wheat for a three-year rotation. And in alfalfa, I mean, in the six-year rotation, we'd have 
corn, soybean, wheat, alfalfa, alfalfa, alfalfa. And so we can compare any phase of the rotation and control for all the weather for that particular year, which is nice. And that'll come into play a little bit later. Um, I'm not going to be talking about the uh, uh, organic two system today. And that's kind of like a foil. It's really a bad system. It goes corn, soybean, corn, soybean. And so it's terrible. We, it's really good at producing weed seeds. That's what it is. Yeah. Um, so within these plots, I set up micro plots. And what we have to uh, pay attention to here, and I failed to label them again, but these three micro plots right here is what we're looking at today. We have a, a, a Roundup Ready corn genotype that's sprayed, a Roundup Ready corn genotype that's not sprayed, and a, and a isoline of the Roundup Ready corn. So it's the same exact genotype, but just without the RR gene in it. And then we have the same thing for soybean. We have the Roundup Ready soybean sprayed, not sprayed, and then the isoline. And so when we're comparing sprayed and not sprayed, we can control for time in the season by comparing the sprayed and the not sprayed of the same genotype that have, that have sort of moved through time together. And then as a secondary comparison, we can compare the Roundup Ready genotype to the isoline to get at whether or not the single gene in there is making any difference. <clears throat> uh, so this, this is just a close up to show you those, those, um, those plots. Um, they're 30, uh, the main plots are 30 feet wide, 390 feet long. We did that every, uh, the micro plots are 10 feet wide by 20 feet long. And we harvested the middle two rows. So um, we, we, we looked at corn and soybean here. To har we harvested 15 centimeter monoliths at two dates, uh, vegetative five and reproductive two. So we basically at vegetative five, we sampled and then sprayed glyphosate. And then about 25 days later at R2, we came in and did this again. So we have right before glyphosate is applied and then 25 days after glyphosate is applied. And that was done for each crop, each genus type and four monoliths per plot. And of course that was replicated. So we isolated bulk and rhizosphere soils. We, we broke the bulk soil away and then brushed the uh, rhizosphere soil. We plated out, we snipped the roots, washed them, or washed them, snipped them. And then uh, we actually surface sterilized them and then plated them out to, uh, on Komata selective media. And this is a selective media for fusarium. Uh, and this part here is really replicating what was done in the literature. And then we, um, we did a lot of soil biochemistry, phospholipid fatty acids, and we did sequencing on 16S and ITS sequencing. We did some additional uh, analysis, which I'll talk about a little bit later, and this, some of this is ongoing. And then with the plants, we also did some plant biochemistry yield and, uh, and did a, a, some, some more specific sort of analysis of symbiotic bacteria. So, folk, so looking at the... Um, at the root plating score. So we scored over 6,100 root segments. We ID'd over 2,400 colonies. My lab was just like, it just was full of plates. It was kind of fun to, to go back and do this. And then we kept coming up with usual suspects based on morphology. So we would, we would streak them out onto minimal media to try to make them sporulate. And while we, were do, ooh, while we were doing that, we would sequence the ITS region of different morphotypes. We did about 384 um, individual ITS sequencing to come up with these 11 taxa, which were sort of the, the usual suspects. And this non-sporulating one is, was uh, some fungi. We couldn't get to sporulate. It would just grow on this minimal media. And, uh, and we just we're, we're, we're trying to figure out what it is, actually. So. So here's, a, here's the results. What we have here is corn on the top row here, 2013-2014. Soy on the bottom row, 2013-2014. Where you see an S, that means that the, uh, sorry, let me step back. And then this is comparing, the blue is the isoline. That's right. 
Blue is isoline. The gray is the Roundup Ready genotype without spray. And the green is the Roundup Ready genotype with spray. Where you see an S, that means the spray was significant. It was a significant increase here when we sprayed. If you see a RR, that means that the gene had an effect. In this case, it, we, it went down. This is fairly significant. Where you see a C, that means it's a comparison between the blue bar and the green bar. That means the combination of the spray and the genotype is significant. Really, what I see here is just messiness. And while we were doing this, my, my whole crew is, is saying to me, why are, why are we doing this? It's really hard to ID a fusarium or a macrofamina just from morphology. And we're going through and, and and doing hundreds and hundreds of samples like this. And, and probably some of the mess in here is mis-IDing these very similar looking fungi. And I said, well, what we're doing is we're looking for this, we're looking for this response. We're trying to see if, when, when we repeated their experiments, if we see this. And, and our, data, our data doesn't support this. Basically, we see, see some random, or not random, but um, um, inconsistent times when we saw significant growth and we would we describe this as, as pretty stochastic growth in, in the sense of we would see colonies here not not there and we had lots of replicates to to try to uh, flesh this out so our data doesn't support this exactly um, and we wanted to uh, to look at things in addition to just fusarium so we ID'd uh, these all these other um, uh, taxa and started looking started looking at them from the standpoint of okay well we have this these consortia of, of organisms here do we see any relationship among the <coughs> among the organisms even if we're if it's not in response to the treatments and the one thing that popped out and this was very clear looking at the plates is that fusarium and macrofamina seem to co-occur together um, and the other thing is that trichoderma seemed antagonistic to fusarium and a few others. Um, but then in some cases, it, it had a positive correlation as well. But in the uh, organic and no-till, trichoderma seemed fairly antagonistic to a uh, number of different organisms. So here's a, here's a picture of fusarium. Tended to be positively correlated with macrofamina, trichoderma, typical green spores, looked like it was antagonistic to a number of, of different um, taxa. So if we, so we moving on to the sequencing part of this project, we wanted to use the same exact samples that we used for the um, root culturing work to then extract um, um, DNA from the sequences and, and or DNA from the samples and attempt to assemble a um, reflection of the, the composition of the microbial community. Um, so I'm going to go through this, and it's a lot of words, but, the, but it might be very important to some people in the audience. So I'll just go through this real quick. So we, we looked at, we used the MySeq platform, and we looked at 1,152 separate samples over 28 plates. So we use full plates. So that's, that's, that gives you an idea of how deep we sequenced. Um, we used, uh, we trimmed the ends using cut adapt. Some of these are fairly new programs. And data two was used to filter the ends and infer sequence variants. So the, the reason I'm pointing this out is that we're not, we're not taking the sequences and trying to align them to a big database and say, what, what species are these? We're using probability to say the, uh, this sequence occurred so many times in my, in my data that it's probably real, even if NCBI or some database doesn't have a copy of that. And so we're determining sequence variants by probability and not whether it's been ID'd before or its similarity to something that's been ID'd before. And I think that's, that's that's kind of where this field is going because we realize we don't we haven't surveyed everything yet, and so it it doesn't make sense to throw out all that variation and 
just keep binning ourselves into clusters or groups that have been commonly identified. Um, we brought this data into PhiloSeq and, and created some, um, some, taxonom uh, some phylogenetic trees and then used that information to uh, create ordinations. Um, within this DSeq2 program, you can, you can uh, run permanovas. And we thought that was a very important thing, especially in a study like this where we have multiple environmental factors and we want to try to tease out which ones are playing the most important role. Um, and then we plotted this out in ggplot and r. And, and, the, and all of this work here, we host on a GitHub, GitHub site. So that, that's a public repository for, for data, data analysis. And we basically put all our scripts up there. So when we publish this, you'll be able to go get our data and our, and our program and rerun everything you, you want to or tweak it the way you think you might. So it's very, uh, very much will be publicly available. Okay, so looking at the sequence, uh, the sequence data, um, here is uh, a rarefaction curve of all of the wells. And this is just to give you an idea of the variance among all the whole experiment. Um, we sequence 300, paired, uh, 300 base pair paired in fragments and um, generated about 129 million reads with a mean um, uh, read count of, of 112 um, per sample. We identified between, now this is, this is actually calling OTUs, but we identified between 800 and 600 OTUs in here. When, when you look at the, the rarefaction measure based on the systems, there's no significant difference among, among the systems. So here's this is a, everyone, or not everyone, but a lot of people have seen these. Recently, this is a, a distribution of the dominant fungal taxa in the farming systems project. And um, see conventional till, no-till, organic three, and organic six. So if you look at it right off the bat, you see, well, they, I actually, well, I won't tell you what I think of these. <laughs> but uh, um, you can see differences here between, uh, in the organic systems, there's some differences here. Um, there's, there's some things that stand out really clearly, like this is present in the no-till and, and, and not as much in the others. And then this one in particular is present in organic three and is, is just in organic. So what are these? This is uh, a basidia mycetes, a, a little puffball. These are, these are all saprophytic organisms. Um, this, this particular organism produces uh, a lot of phenol oxidases and actually produces lipases. Um, <clears throat> this uh, Pisia zales, you've see, probably seen these out in the field if you work, if you ever work out in the field in corn or soybean fields. Um, this, we, all, we really only saw, or mainly in the organic systems. I think this is, I think, I think this is interesting that, that there are, um, that there are organisms that seem sort of dominant in organic systems as opposed to conventional systems. These, these systems receive poultry litter. There are different inputs, so it's very hard to sort of dissect out exactly what could be influencing these, but we're, uh, we're going to follow up on this. And then um, here, this, this um, <clears throat> Ascotia is a leaf, is a leaf lesion. And what's very, what's interesting about this is it, it seems to come on late in the season. So no one really focuses on it as a pathogen, but you can see it all over that a bean plant um, and it, it infects wheat as well. And people have thought that it really doesn't do much because it comes on right towards the ends of, end of seed fill. But I, I wonder though, if, if some organisms that we see appear late in the season like that are not actually latent organisms that are impacting the, the growth of these, um, of these crops and maybe uh, more highly abundant in some systems rather than others. So 
if we want to look at the structure of the fungal community, uh, generally what we'll do is, is develop distance matrices. Uh, and in this case, we've done that and plotted them using uh, NDMS with a transform time step. And so this looks pretty confusing, right? And when I, um, but if you look here, you have date 2014, this triangle 2013 is a circle, and the different systems are the different colors. I think you can see that the no-till is here, the CT, we've got org six here, and, and the org three over here. In general, the circles, and it's, it, it's a little clearer in corn than in, and in soybean, but the circles are on the lower part, and the triangles are up further in the graph, above the zero the axis. Now, what we tried to do here was because we observed just looking at shear um, fungal counts on plates, we knew that there were major differences between years. We know that there were differences in temperature, not only the, the mean temperature, but the timing or the, the, the periodicity of the temperature, but also the water. Right? So what we tried to do here was create a covariant matrix that we could transform the data with to account for the time factor, since we knew it was a factor. I don't know if, it, I don't think it worked, really. I mean, it worked, okay, but, but there's better ways to do that. And um, this new, the, there's a new implementation of, of time two which explicitly addresses this. So time series and repeated measures. And, um, and so Greg uh, Caparasso, who wrote this program, is, come, is gonna come to my lab next week, and we're gonna work on this because, and, and he's doing this right now in human microbiome systems where you have many individuals who all start <coughs> off with a different microbiome and you give them a treatment and they all move, like the microbiomes move, but they're not all sort of coalescing as a single one. And so that's where that, this, uh, the need for doing this came from. But I think in ag science, we have a real need for this as well. So hopefully in the next few weeks, we'll be able to create a covariant structure that we can use to control for the things that we know have changed, especially over time, so time and weather. So if we just look straight at abundances and, and, and code this, this data differently, we're act actually doing it differently with, a, with a, a PCA analysis. So where we don't, we had to use NMDS because of the way we did the transformation of the data. But this is just a Bray-Curtis distance matrix represented in PCA. Uh, PCA. And, and the difference is here we have spray and no spray. So the CT spray and no spray is here. NT spray and no sprays here. And the spray and no spray are kind of all jumbled on top of each other here. Uh, the organic six here, again, spray and no spray jumbled on top of each other. And here's the organic three over there. When I saw this, I was very excited because I thought, wow, that's really great. Um, after 26 years of, of management of these systems, we could see really clear, like distinct microbial communities that have been, that have developed over our consistent differential management of these systems. Um, I, oh, I generally don't like drawing circles around things because I'm like, hey, what does that mean? But we have statistics to back that up. So that's why, that's why I did this. So pretty clear that we have um, distinction among, among the systems, but no clear distinction among whether spray has an effect. Um, this, these, and I look at these a lot, but I don't know if you see it, but time, if we coded this by time, you'd see 2013 and 2014, 2013, 2014. So you can kind of see that differential in there. And so hopefully when we apply better statistics to this, we'll maybe be able to consolidate those, um, those data clouds a little bit better and, and have a better understanding of how each individual plot or each individual plot, yeah, changes when we apply glyphosate. So I feel like we're, we're not drilling in 
well enough here. So we, we did Permanova. Um, I, 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 like, I like using Permanova for the, the sort of complex models like this. Um, so the soy is on top and the corn is on the bottom. And really the take home message is that the system is significant and the year is significant. The sampling date, meaning before spray or after spray is significant. And I'm not sure how much faith I put in this interaction term here. Uh, this is pretty consistent uh, among crops. And this data is, is, I mean, these same exact factors are what we see when we look at our other locations, which were in Mississippi and Illinois. My, what, my graduate student sent me a, um, the Permanova for the bacterial stuff this morning, and, and he, he's showing some, some of the same results, but some things are different, and it might be that the bacteria are actually responding more to, um, to both system and glyphosate application, but that will be some other, another talk. Um, okay, so what can we do? What can we do with this data? We could. Uh, so this is the change in abundance um, of the, ma the major taxa, the change in abundance in response to glyphosate application. So what you see here are a wide variety of organisms uh, that both incre increase or decrease in relation to spray. So. Um, the, we can, I, we can um, place um, organisms on this plot that are ident unidentified down to the genus level uh, because we use that variant calling approach where we're not relegated to picking a particular uh, OTU name from, from a database. And so in the case of here, uh, here we have Fusarium, this is a species of fusarium that, uh, that increased, and we also see some fusarium that decreased. And so really what, what we're seeing is no general response to glyphosate application, but most likely, if, if these are actually responding to, to the glyphosate, that there's differential response, and there's some other evidence in the literature that that may actually be the case, that you might have bacteria and fungi that are resistant or not resistant um, based on the, the sensitivity of that, of that gene that, uh, in the shikimic acid pathway. So conclusions, um, there are no clear positive or negative impacts of glyphosate application. And the presence of the Roundup Ready gene on the likelihood of fusarium being, being present in the corn was not was not clear either. It really looks like there's, there's not a strong impact of that. Um, the culturing data suggests that some organisms may co-occur, um, such as Fusarium macrofemina, and some may be antagonistic, like Fusarium versus Trichoderma. Um, so the sequencing data suggests that the overall fungal diversity among the systems is not significantly different, but the structure of the community is different. So the, the overall diversity is not, is not different. And um, with, the, with the tools that we're using right now, we, we can't discern whether there's an effect of glyphosate, but these results suggest to the best of, that we can that there is no um, effect of glyphosate on the soil microbial community. So we're gonna be working on the repeated measures to refine this analysis. So where do we go from here? Let's see. Um, let's see. So Dietrich is working on network analysis. And this is an, this is an example from this, this paper. Um, Dietrich actually has, has a paper out in which he did this type of network analysis with him on a, on a different study. Um, but he is go he's going to apply these two different types of network analysis, like a, glo a global analysis, which would take into consideration all of the interactions between the um, organisms that are identified in any particular sample. And we could imagine this as we may see networks that break out into nodes that are, that are representative of 
of either crops or systems. We're not sure how that's gonna, gonna look right now, but we would, we would imagine it would be some, something sort of uh, disjointed like this. The, the other type of network analysis, which we wanna look into is this pairwise, pairwise analysis where you create minimal networks that then have very specific rules for how OTUs or organisms fit into the network. So in this, in this case here, and this gets at this co-occurrence question, this is, a, this is a, an example of where there's a rule. If there's a bacterioidea and a, and, a, um, and a pseudomonas, then this flavor bacterium will be present. So basically it's saying um, out of all the data, you know, if there's these two organisms, this other organism is always going to be present. And we want to do, we want to um, look specifically at some of those questions to, to get at um, potential antagonists for crop diseases. And we think we may be able to pick them out of um, data sets like this. And the fact that we have a culturing project that goes right along with this, we have all the isolates in hand. So once we get the genotypes, we could go back and screen the actual organisms. So we've done a little bit of this already. This is my postdoc, Ryan Kepler. We actually started this project after we, we started doing the sampling on the main project, but we finished this beforehand. And this is where we said, okay, now if we have organisms that are like varying their response to our, our management, some are going up, some are going down, maybe we can get a handle on how these cropping systems are affecting these organisms by sort of drilling in to one organism where we know a lot more about the genetic diversity. So in this case, um, we're, we're interested in this organism, Metarhizium, which is an entomopathogenic fungi. And we're particularly interested in it because it, it kills bugs. And we've been working with it a little bit as a biocontrol for <laughs> organic systems. Looks uh, kind of like trichoderma in that case. Um, and so what, what Ryan did was he targeted nine loci that are involved in metarhizium mating type. And we went in and out of, out of these, these um, soils that were collected from the, uh, from the field, went in and um, cloned, barcoded, indexed, and sequenced these nine um, different, um, different loci. And what we were able to do from that was determine that there were that there were two major clades of Metarhizium robertaceae uh, present. So we, have, we identified two major clades. And what we have here is, is, this is the same data, it's just coded differently. This is clade one, and this is clade two. This is a minimal spanning network for unique microsatellites. So what this, what this is, is these OTUs are always associated with these. The thicker the line, the stronger the association. And the thinner the line, the weaker the association. There's, there's actually just a teeny tiny dotted line there. And what we're looking at in the top half of this, what we're looking at is the, the size of, of the node is how many OTUs we collected that, that fall into that, that node. Um, and so, so it's the actual abundance. And then the, the pie chart in there is how the, those OTUs were distributed among soybean, corn, or alfalfa. And so what you can see is that clade one and clade two respond very differently to, the differ, to these different crops. So, um, or somewhat differently. There's, there's some that, uh, that are, some OTUs that are dominated by corn, some that are dominated by soybean. If we look on the lower half, we're looking at the, at the system, and there you can see differences as well. So in, in, this, in this case, some, the, these OTUs are, are, in this case, preferentially found in organic six, and um, here they're evenly distributed. So what this is telling us is that even within I mean, this, if we sequence the ITS of this metarhizium, it would tell us it's the same exact organism. Yet, at a much finer scale, we can see that, that different mating types of this single organism are responding differently to um, both the system and the crop. 
So overall, I would say that um, our farming state, you know, our farming systems management, it does influence the microbial community structure. And, um, and in some cases, our broad ways of identifying these organisms uh, may be like clouding our ability to really look at the fine, the, the fine-tuned effects of our management decisions. And I think ultimately, you know, our, our goal isn't to, to be able to identify an organism. The, the reason we want to do that is so we can monitor these organisms, so we can see how when we make decisions uh, uh, in the field, when we, when we make a decision that's going to be a long-term decision for how we manage this field, we want to be able to monitor these organisms closely enough so we can see if they are being affected, if they're resilient to change, if they're functioning the way we want them to. So in the end, we're really trying to design tools that allow us to assess the, the agro ecosystem and make recommendations that, that, um, that provide resilience and, and uh, sustainability for long term. So with that, that, this is the team of folks that helped in this project, Stephanie Yarwood from University of Maryland, graduate students and postdocs, and then a bunch of folks from USDA in Beltsville. Um, yeah, that's it. Hi. Have you continued to do this? I'm thinking of long-term experiments because people don't usually apply around it for one year or two years. They keep doing it over decades, right? Yeah. So is anyone looking into long-term effects? Yes, well, we, um, one of the things we tried to do here was to compare fields, like the organic fields had never had glyphosate before. And I didn't really get into this that much, but the organic fields never had, glyph never, had, had never seen glyphosate, and the conventional fields had seen glyphosate for 20 something years. So it's, um, so in terms of experimental design, we were kind of stepping back in history and saying, okay, here are these examples that are already set. Can we start to determine differences between them? In our other locations, we had fields that had been in, under, under management with glyphosate for 15 years or so, and, and fields that were just transitioned out of like, hey, and those, are, those are very, very different. It's very hard to set up an, ex an experiment like that, but, it, but you might have to look at systems that are already existing, you know, to get those long-term <clears throat> effects. But um, glyphosate has been around since the 70s, so there's, I'm sure there's examples of this. Um, I'm, I think Cornell has examples of long-term with and without glyphosate application. I'm not sure. No, maybe. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I'm really excited to see what your soil bacteria is doing to see because your experiment is actually a perfect design to test for this idea that with continuous 20 something years of life state applications versus not having that application, um, what would be, is it, is it possible that you have an enrichment of soil bacteria with life state resistance genes? Because Initially, the, the whole uh, GMO the plants that had that trait, it was initially isolated from soil bacteria. Yeah, yeah. So if you could take some of your, a subset of your soil samples from the different genes and then submit it for metagenomic sequencing where you get whole metagenomes, yeah. then you look for the resistance genes and then maybe look to see if certain cacti are, you see diversification or overall gene transfer of those genes. Yeah. That would be a really amazing mind Right, oh. right. So we're, think, we're thinking about that. And we went into this. So I have a whole another presentation on the nitrogen fixation within the soybean groups. And if you saw on the microplot um, map, there were some microplots I didn't talk about that said non-nodulating. And there, so we had a whole other complement to this experiment. And <coughs> instead of doing the metagenome, well, we're doing the, some of that, but what we did was we isolated the rhizobia from the nodules of the sprayed and non-sprayed Roundup Ready plants and the, and the isoline plants. And 
we're, we're planning on look and doing specific PCR basically to, to sequence those genes from the different isolates to look for the resistant and the non-resistant ones. And we, we would basically do correlation analysis there. But the, um, I think the metagenomic analysis might, I mean, that would be great and a lot of information. It might be overkill to get at that one question and very expensive, you know, for the amount of samples that we had. So we were thinking of, of getting isolates, like some <coughs> 1,000 isolates or something like that, and just start sequencing those, uh, the, um, the, um, the pyruvate phosphate synthase gene. You know, for, yeah. So yeah, I'm thinking along the same lines. But yes, Dan. This is this is a sort of maybe a knock-on question, and it's it's not directly something you talked about in your talk. But I'm just curious because you probably know better than anybody the answer to this. So, so with anything, that the dose makes the poison, right? When we spray glyphosate onto plants, it has surfactants in it and things, or, or things that make it stick to the leaf. We spray it right on the leaf. We make sure it sticks on the leaf, so it kills those things. Or not, if it's ready, yeah. right? But it's not getting taken up through the soil. So, so is there data on what is the actual concentration of glyphosate in the soil, even at the time of application, let alone like a week later, two weeks later? Yeah. And then, that, for what period of the year would you have a concentration of glyphosate in the soil that would, because this is a competitive inhibitor, so it, it needs to be at a high enough concentration to have an effect. So, for what period of the year would it exceed the concentration that the bacteria would even see it? Yeah. Right. So. There is data on the exudation rate. And we, we specifically did, uh, there was, I, I used to call it like the, the indirect effects of glyphosate application because you're applying it to the plant and you're affecting the microbes. And that's like, I, I think a neat aspect of this in just in general, that it's all of this, any treatment effect is transmitted through a plant xylem, right? Um, there's information on that. Plants leak a lot of glyphosate. The surfactants stay, or some of them stay unleaked. And I forget what the exact number was, but it was, um, it was, it, it was in the tens of percent of the actual applied concentration. And, um, and it does stay in the rhizosphere. And that paper, I, there's a paper, I can give you the reference later, but the, one of the papers, well, it's all recorded, so you can see. One of the papers that I put up here that talked about the stoichiometry of glyphosate addresses that issue, and specifically, um, uh, specifically how, how much of the product gets transformed into breakdown products, because that's another issue. Because not only is glyphosate a poison, but it's breakdown product that is created in the plant as, as, a, <coughs> as a way of, of detoxifying it, is itself a toxin, but <coughs> interestingly enough, more to unicellular organisms. So as a source over time to the rhizosphere. For, yes, for sure. AMPA, which is a breakdown product. And anyway, um, but but yeah, that's a that's a very interesting question because it is like a it's a pulse and a select a selection that will then fade. And the half life of, of glyphosate, the molecule itself, is like under two weeks, I think, in the in the soil itself, unless it's mixed with something. Then you have a whole different thing. But it's if you I mean if you look at it, it looks like great microbial food. Right, so it doesn't. When it's done labeling studies, it doesn't stick around for a long time. But you do get that pulse, so the susceptible bacteria are probably succumbing to it at least in the short term. Okay, last one. Oh, yeah, I just a, a quick comment, and a more importantly, question. Uh, in, in the plant pathology uh, research on this, there are a lot of biotrophic pathogens are actually. Uh, the application, it increases resistance in the plant uh, to a lot of bio, biotrophic organisms, but like for, for, for some of the faculty in Paris, uh, uh, saprophytes you mentioned, it increases their number and there's actually more disease. So it depends on the lifestyle of the, of the fungus as well, is that what that direction between glyphosate and, and, the, and the fungus. But I was curious, you started out your discussion about plant health. Is there any intention to actually look at symptomology? And, and both fusarium and, and uh, macrophemina would lend themselves very well because they both cause very pronounced root rots in both the soybean and the corn. Right. And, and so numbers of things are great, but it would be interesting to see, are you getting more root rot correlated right. with this? Right. So as you probably know, it's very difficult to 
assess that. And when it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of time. Yeah, it's not difficult to assess yeah. it. It's difficult. Yeah. But we we had a pathologist out in our fields, okay. and they were like, "There's not a lot of disease here at all." Okay. So, so we generally don't have fusarium and macrothamina as a problem in Maryland. Um, in a way, I'm thinking maybe well, those are data points for you. Yeah, zero are data points. <laughs> No. No. On the other side of the farm, it's very sandy. Uh, this section here is pretty clay. Actually, there's an <coughs> old brick factory up the road. Huh. Yeah. Okay, we need to stop there. Um, do you, uh, it's pretty busy this afternoon with meetings. He will join us for morning tea tomorrow. Um, up in the lounge on the seventh floor, and then he has time after that to meet with folks. Uh, tomorrow Friday. So if you would like to have a time with you, please come and let us know and we can get you into the schedule. Um, and join me in thanking you. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.